The Pharsalia by Lucan Book Two, The Flight of Pompeius Thus was made plain the anger of the gods. The universe gave signs nature reversed in monstrous tumult, fraught with prodigies, her laws, and prescient spoke the coming guilt. How seemed it just to thee, Olympus's king, that suffering mortals at thy doom should know by omens dire the massacre to come? Or did the primal parent of the world, when first the flames gave way, and yielding left matter unformed to his subduing hand, and realms unbalanced, fix by stern decree unalterable laws to bind the whole, himself too bound by law, so that for a all nature moves within its fated bounds? Or is chance sovereign over all, and we the sport of fortune and her turning wheel? Whate'er be truth, keep thou the future veiled from mortal vision, and amid their fears may men still hope. Thus known how great the woes the world should suffer from the truth divine, a solemn fast was called, the courts were closed, all men in private garb. No purple hem adorned the togas of the chiefs of Rome. No plaints were uttered, and a voiceless grief lay deep in every bosom, as when death knocks at some door, but enters not as yet, before the mother calls the name aloud, or bids her grieving maidens beat the breast, while still she marks the glazing eye and soothes the stiffening limbs and gazes on the face in nameless dread, not sorrow and in awe of death approaching, and with mind distraught, clings to the dying in a last embrace. The matrons laid aside their wonted garb. Crowds filled the temples. On the unpitying stones, some dashed their bosoms. Others bathed with tears the statues of the gods. Some tore their hair upon the holy threshold, and with shrieks and vows unceasing called upon the names of those whom mortals supplicate. Nor all lay in the thunderer's fane. At every shrine some prayers are offered, which refused shall bring reproach on heaven. One whose livid arms were dark with blows, whose cheeks with tears bedewed and riven, cried, Beat mothers, beat the breast! Tear now the lock, while doubtful in the scales still fortune hangs, nor yet the fight is won, you still may grieve. When either wins, rejoice. Thus sorrow stirs itself. Meanwhile the men, seeking the camp and setting forth to war, address the cruel gods in just complaint. Happy the youths who, born in Punic days, on Cannae's uplands, or by Trebia's stream, fought and were slain. What wretched lot is ours! No peace we ask for. Let the nations raise, rage. Rouse fiercest cities. May the world find arms to wage a war with Rome. Let Parthian hosts rush forth from Susa. Scythian Ister curb no more the Massagete. Unconquered Rhine, let loose from furthest north her fair-haired tribes. Elbe, pour thy Suevians forth. Let us be foes of all the peoples. May the Getan press here and the Dacian there. Pompeius meet the eastern archer. Caesar in the west confront the Iberian. Leave to Rome no hand to raise against herself in civil strife. Or, if Italia by the gods be doomed, let all the sky, fierce parent, be dissolved, and falling on the earth in flaming bolts, their hands still bloodless, strike both leaders down, with both their hosts. Why, why plunge in novel crime, to settle which of them shall rule in Rome? Scarce were it worth the price of civil war to hinder either. Thus the patriot voice still found an utterance, soon to speak no more. Meantime, the aged fathers o'er their fates in anguish grieved, detesting life prolonged, that brought with it another civil war. And thus spake one, to justify his fears. No other deeds the fates laid up in store when Marius, victor over Teuton hosts, Afric's high conqueror, cast out from Rome, lay hid in marshy ooze, 
at thy behest, O fortune, by the yielding soil concealed and waving rushes. But ere long the chains of prison wore his weak and aged frame and lengthened squalor. Thus he paid for crime his punishment beforehand, doomed to die, consul in triumph over wasted Rome. Death oft refused him, and the very foe in act to murder shuddered in the stroke and dropped the weapon from his nerveless hand. For through the prison gloom a flame of light he saw, the deities of crime abhorred, the Marius to come. A voice proclaimed mysterious, Hold, the fates permit thee not that neck to sever. Many a death he owes to time's predestined laws, ere his shall come. Cease from thy madness. If ye seek revenge for all the blood shed by your shot slaughtered tribes, let this man, Cimbrians, live out all his days. Not as their darling did the gods protect the man of blood, but for his ruthless hand, fit to prepare that sacrifice of gore which fate demanded. By the sea's despite born to our foes, Jugurtha's wasted realm he saw, now conquered. There in squalid huts a while he lay, and trod the hostile dust of Carthage, and his ruin matched with hers. Each from the other's fate some solace drew, and prostrate pardoned heaven. On Libyan soil, fresh fury gathering, next, when fortune smiled, the prisons he threw wide and freed the slaves. Forth rushed the murderous bands, their melted chains forged into weapons for his ruffian needs. No charge he gave to mere recruits in guilt, who brought not to the camp some proof of crime. How dread that day when conquering Marius seized the city's ramparts, with what faded speed death strode upon his victims. Plebs alike and nobles perished, far and near the sword struck at his pleasure, till the temple floors ran wet with slaughter and the crimson stream befouled with slippery gore the holy walls. No age found pity, men of failing years, just tottering to the grave, were hurled to death. From infants in their being's earliest dawn, the growing life was severed. For what crime? "'Twas cause enough for death that they could die. "'The fury grew. "'Soon t'was a sluggard's part to seek the guilty. Hundreds died to swell the tale of victims. "'Shamed by empty hands, "'the blood-stained conquerors snatched a reeking head from neck unknown. "'One way of life remained, "'to kiss with shuddering lips the red right hand. "'Degenerate people, had ye hearts of men, Though ye were threatened by a thousand swords, far rather death than centuries of life bought at such price. Much more that breathing space till Sulla comes again. But time would fail in weeping for the deaths of all who fell. Encircled by innumerable bands fell Bibius, his limbs asunder torn, his vitals dragged abroad. Antonius, too, prophet of ill, whose hoary head was placed, dripping with blood, upon the festal board. There, headless, fell the Crassi, mangled frames neath Fimbria's falchion, and the prison cells were wet with Tribune's blood. Hard by the fane where dwells the goddess and the sacred fire fell aged Skyvola, though that gory hand had spared him but the feeble tide of blood still left the flame alive upon the hearth. That selfsame year, the seventh time restored the consul's rods. That year to Marius brought the end of life, when he at fortune's hands all ills had suffered, all her goods enjoyed. And what of those who at the Sacre port and Coline gate were slain? Then, when the rule of earth and all her nations almost left this city for another, and the chiefs who led the Samnite hoped that Rome might bleed more than at Caudium's forks she bled of old. Then came great Sulla to avenge the dead, and all the blood still left within her frame drew from the city, for the surgeon knife which shore the cancerous limbs cut in too deep, 
and shed the life-stream from still healthy veins. True that the guilty fell, but not before all else had perished. Hatred had free course, and anger reigned unbridled by the law. The victor's voice spake once, but each man struck just as he wished or willed. The fatal steel, urged by the servant, laid the master low. Sons dripped with gore of sires, and brothers fought for the foul trophy of a father slain, or slew each other for the price of blood. Men sought the tombs, and mingling with the dead, hoped for escape. The wild beast dens were full. One strangled died, another from the height fell headlong down upon the unpitying earth, and from the encrimsoned victor snatched his death. One built his funeral pyre, and oped his veins, and sealed the furnace ere his blood was gone. Born through the trembling town, the leaders' heads were piled in middle forum. Hence men knew of murders, else unpublished. Not on gates of Diomedes, tyrant king of Thrace, nor of Antaeus, Libya's giant brood, were hung such horrors, nor in Pisa's hall, were seen and wept for when the suitors died. Decay had touched the features of the slain, when round the mouldering heap, with trembling steps, the grief-struck parents sought and stole their dead. I, too, the body of my brother slain, thought to remove my victim to the peace which Sola made, and place his loved remains on the forbidden pyre. The head I found but not the butchered course. Why now renew the tale of Catullus's shade appeased, and those dread tortures which the living frame of Marius suffered at the tomb of him who haply wished them not? Pierced, mangled, torn, nor speech nor grasp was left, his every limb maimed, hacked, and riven. Yet the fatal blow of the murderers with savage purpose spared. "'Twas scarce believed that one poor mortal frame "'such agonies could bear ere death should come. "'Thus crushed beneath some ruin lie the dead, "'thus shapeless from the deep are born the drowned. "'Why spoil delight by mutilating thus the head of Marius? "'To please Sulla's heart, that mangled visage must be known to all. "'Fortune, high goddess of Prynestes' fame, saw all her townsmen hurried to their deaths in one fell instant. All the hope of Rome, the flower of Latium, stained with blood the field where once the peaceful tribes their votes declared. Famine and sword, the raging sky and sea, and earth upheaved, have laid such numbers low, but ne'er one man's revenge. Between the slain and living victims there was space no more. Death le thus let slip, to deal the fatal blow. Hardly when struck they fell. The severed head scarce toppled from the shoulders, but the slain, blent in one weighty pile of massacre, pressed out the life and helped the murderer's arm. Secure from stain upon his lofty throne, unshuddering sat the author of the whole nor feared that at his word such thousands fell. At length the Tuscan flood received the dead, the first upon his waves, the last on those that lay beneath them. Vessels in their course were stayed, and while the lower current flowed still to the sea, the upper stood on high, dammed back by carnage. Through the streets, meanwhile, in headlong torrents, ran a tide of blood, which, furrowing its path through town and field, forced the slow river on. But now his banks no longer held him, and the dead were thrown back on the fields above, with labor huge. At length he struggled to his goal, and stretched, in crimson streak, across the Tuscan sea. For deeds like these shall Sulla now be styled darling of fortune, saviour of the state. For these a tomb in middle field of Mars record his fame. Like horrors now return for us to suffer. 
and the civil war thus shall be waged again, and thus shall end. Yet worse disasters may our fears suggest. For now, with greater carnage of mankind, the rival hosts in weightier battle meet. To exiled Marius, successful strife was Rome regained. Triumphant Sulla knew no greater joy than on his hated foes to wreak his vengeance with unsparing sword. But these more powerful rivals fortune calls to worse ambitions, nor would either chief, for such reward as Sulla's, wage the war. Thus, mindful of his youth, the aged man wept for the past, but feared the coming days. Such terrors found in haughty Brutus's breast no home. When others sat them down to fear, he did not so. But in the dewy night, when the great wain was turning round the pole, he sought his kinsman Cato's humble home. Him sleepless did he find, not for himself fearing, but pondering the fates of Rome, and deep in public cares. And thus he spake. O thou, in whom that virtue, which of your took flight from earth, now finds its only home, outcast to all besides, but safe with thee. Vouchsafe thy counsel to my wavering soul, and make my weakness strength. While Caesar some, Pompeius others, follow in the fight, Cato is Brutus's guide. Art thou for peace, holding thy footsteps in a tottering world unshaken? Or wilt thou, with the leader's crimes, and with the people's fury take thy part, and by thy presence purge the war of guilt. In impious battles men unsheathe the sword, but each by cause impelled, the household crime, laws feared in peace, want by the sword removed, and broken credit that its ruin hides in general ruin. Drawn by hope of gain and not by thirst for blood, they seek the camp. Shall Cato, for war's sake, make war alone? What profits it through all these wicked years that thou hast lived untainted? This were all thy meed of virtue, that the wars which find guilt in all else shall make thee guilty too. Ye gods, permit not that this fatal strife should stir those hands to action, when the clouds of flying javelins hiss upon the air, let not a dart be thine, nor spent in vain such virtue. All the fury of the war shall launch itself on thee, for who, when faint and wounded, would not rush upon thy sword, take thence his death, and make the murder thine. Do thou live on thy peaceful life apart, as on their paths the stars unshaken roll, the lower air that verges on the earth gives flame and fury to the leaven bolt. The deeps below the world engulf the winds and tracts of flaming fire. By Jove's decree, Olympus rears his summit o'er the clouds. In lowlier valleys, storms and winds contend, but peace eternal reigns upon the heights. What joy for Caesar if the tidings come that such a citizen has joined the war! Glad would he see the e'en and Magnus's tents, for Cato's conduct shall approve his own. Pompeius, with the consul in his ranks, and half the senate and the other chiefs, vexes my spirit. And should Cato, too, bend to a master's yoke, in all the world the one man free is Caesar. But if thou, for freedom and thy country's laws alone be pleased to raise the sword. Nor Magnus then, nor Caesar, shall in Brutus find a foe. Not till the fight is fought shall Brutus strike, then strike the victor. Brutus thus, but spake Cato from inmost breast these sacred words. Chief in all wickedness is civil war. Yet virtue in the paths marked out by fate treads on securely. Heavens will be the crime to have made even Cato guilty. Who has strength to gaze unawed upon a toppling world? When stars and sky fall headlong, and when earth slips from her base, 
who sits with folded hands? Shall unknown nations, touched by western strife, and monarchs born beneath another clime, brave the dividing seas to join the war? Shall Scythian tribes desert their distant north, and Gete haste to view the fall of Rome, and I look idly on? As some fond sire, reft of his sons, compelled by grief, himself marshals the long procession to the tomb, thrusts his own hand within the funeral flames, soothing his heart, and, as the lofty pyre rises on high, applies the kindled torch. Not Rome shall tear thee from me, till I hold thy form in death embraced, and freedom's name, shade though it be, I'll follow to the grave. Yea, let the cruel gods exact in full Rome's expiation. Of no drop of blood the war be robbed. I would that to the gods of heaven and hell devoted, this my life might satisfy their vengeance. Decius fell, crushed by the hostile ranks. When Cato falls, let Rhine's fierce barbarous hordes and both the hosts thrust through my frame their darts. May I alone receive in death the wounds of all the war. Thus may the people be redeemed, and thus Rome for her guilt pay the atonement due. Why should men die who wish to bear the yoke, and shrink not from the tyranny to come? Strike me, and me alone, of laws and rights in vain the guardian. This vicarious life shall give Hesperia peace and end her toils. Who then will reign shall find no need for war. You ask, why follow Magnus? If he wins, he too will claim the empire of the world. Then let him, conquering with my service, learn not for himself to conquer. Thus he spoke, and stirred the blood that ran in Brutus's veins, moving the youth to action in the war. Soon as the sun dispelled the chilly night, the sounding doors flew wide, and from the tomb of dead Hortensius, grieving Marcia came. First joined in wedlock to a greater man, three children did she bear to grace his home. Then Cato to Hortensius gave the dame to be a fruitful mother of his sons, and join their houses in a closer tie. And now the last sad offices were done. She came with hair disheveled, beaten breast, and ashes on her brow, and features worn with grief, thus only pleasing to the man. When youth was in me, and maternal power, I did thy bidding, Cato, and received a second husband. Now in years grown old, ne'er to be parted, I return to thee. Renew our former pledges undefiled. Give back the name of wife. Upon my tomb let Marcia, spouse to Cato, be engraved. Nor let men question in the time to come, Didst thou compel, or did I willing leave my first espousals? Not in happy times, partner of joys, I come. But days of care and labor shall be mine to share with thee. Nor leave me here, but take me to the camp, thy fond companion. Why should Magnus's wife be nearer, Cato, to the wars than thine? Although the times were warlike, and the fates called to the fray, he lent a willing ear. Yet must they plight their faith in simple form of law, their witnesses the gods alone. No festal wreath of flowers crowned the gate, nor glittering fillet on each post entwined. No flaming torch was there, nor ivory steps, no couch with robes of broidered gold adorned, no comely matron placed upon her brow the bridal garland, or forbade the foot to touch the threshold stone. No saffron veil concealed the timid blushes of the bride. No jeweled belt confined her flowing robe, nor modest circle bound her neck, 
no scarf hung lightly on the snowy shoulder's edge around the naked arm just as she came wearing the garb of sorrow while the wool covered the purple border of her robe thus was she wedded as she greets her sons so doth she greet her husband festal games graced not their nuptials nor were friends and kin as by the sabines bidden silent both they joined in marriage yet content unseen by any save by brutus sad and stern on cato's lineaments the marks of grief were still unsoftened and the hoary hair hung o'er his reverend visage for since first men flew to arms his locks were left unkempt to stream upon his brow and on his chin his beard untended grew twas his alone who hated not nor loved for all mankind to mourn alike nor did their former couch again receive them for his lofty soul e'en lawful love resisted twas his rule inflexible to keep the middle path marked out and bounded to observe the laws of natural right and for his country's sake to risk his life his all as not for self brought into being but for all the world such was his creed to him a sumptuous feast was hunger conquered and the lowly hut which scarce kept out the winter was a home equal to palaces a robe of price such hairy garments as were worn of old the end of marriage offspring to the state father alike and husband right and law he ever followed with unswerving step no thought of selfish pleasure turned the scale in cato's acts or swayed his upright soul meanwhile pompeius led his trembling host to fields companion and held the walls first founded by the chief of trojan race these chose he for the central seat of war some troops dispatching who might meet the foe where shady apennine lifts up the ridge of mid italia nearest to the sky up soaring with the seas on either hand the upper and the lower pisa's sands breaking the margin of the tuscan deep here bound his mountains there ancona's towers laved by dalmatian waves rivers immense in his recesses born pass on their course to either sea diverging to the left metaurus and crustumian's torrent fall and senna streams and alphidus who bursts on adrian billows and that mighty flood which more than all the rivers of the earth sweeps down the soil and tears the woods away and drains hesperia's springs in fabled lore his banks were first by poplar shade enclosed and when by phaeton the waning day was drawn in path transverse and all the heaven blazed with his car aflame and from the depths of inmost earth were wrapped all other floods padus still rolled in pride of stream along nile were no longer but that o'er the sand of level egypt he spreads out his waves nor ister if he sought the scythian main unhelped upon his journey through the world by tributary waters not his own but on the right hand tiber has his source deep flowing rutuba vulturnus swift and sarnus breathing, breathing vapors of the night rise there and lyris with vestinian wave still gliding through marica's shady grove and siler flowing through salernian me meads and macra's swift unnavigable stream by luna lost in ocean on the alps whose spurs strike plainwards and on fields of gaul the cloudy heights of apennine look down in further distance on his nearer slopes the sabine turns the plowshare umbrian kine and marcian fatten with his pine-clad rocks he girds the tribes of latium nor leaves hesperia's soil until the waves that beat on scylla's wave compel his southern spurs extend to juno's temple and of old stretch further than italia till the main o'erstepped his limits and the lands repelled 
But when the seas were joined, Pelorus claimed his latest summits for Cecilia's isle. Caesar, in rage for war, rejoicing found foes in Italia. No bloodless steps nor vacant homes had pleased him, so his march were wasted. Now the coming war was joined, unbroken to the past, to force the gates, not find them open, fire and sword to bring upon the harvest, not through fields unharmed to pass his legions. This was Caesar's joy. In peaceful guise to march, this was his shame. Italia's cities, doubtful in their choice, though to the earliest onset of the war about to yield, strengthened their walls with mounds and deepest trench encircling massive stones and bolts of war to hurl upon the foe they place upon the turrets magnus most the people's favor held yet faith with fear fought in their breasts as when with strident blast a southern tempest has possessed the main and all the billows follow in its track then by the storm's king smitten, should the earth set Eurus free upon the swollen deep, it shall not yield to him, though cloud and sky confess his strength, but in the former wind still find its master. But their fears prevailed, and Caesar's fortune, or their wavering faith. For Libo fled Etruria, Umbria lost her freedom, driving Thermus from her bounds. Great Sulla's son, unworthy of his sire, feared at the name of Caesar. Varus sought the caves and woods, when smote the hostile horse the gates of Auximon. And Spinther, driven from Asculum, the victor on his track, fled with his standards, soldierless. And thou, Scipio, didst leave Nuceria's citadel, deserted, though by bravest legions held, sent home by Caesar for the Parthian war whom Magnus earlier to his kinsmen gave a loan of Roman blood to fight the Gaul. But brave Domitius held firm his post behind Corfinium's ramparts. His the troops, who, newly levied, kept the judgment hall at Milo's trial. When from far the plain rolled up a dusty cloud, beneath whose veil the sheen of armor glistening in the sun revealed a marching host. Dash down, he cried, swift as ye can, this bridge that spans the stream. And thou, O river, from thy mountain source, with all thy torrents rushing, planks and beams, ruined and broken on thy foaming breast, bear onward to the sea. The war shall stop here, to our triumph, for this headlong chief, here first at our firm bidding, shall be stayed. He bade his squadrons, speeding from the walls, charge on the bridge. In vain, for Caesar saw they sought to free the river from his chains, and bar his march. And roused to ire, he cried, Were not the walls sufficient to protect your coward souls? Seek ye by barricades and streams to keep me back? What though the flood of swollen Ganges were across my path? Now Rubicon is past. No stream on earth shall hinder Caesar. Forward, horse and foot, and ere it totters, rush upon the bridge. Urged in their swiftest gallop to the front, dashed the light horse across the sounding plain, and suddenly as storm in summer flew a cloud of javelins forth by sinewy arms hurled at the foe. The guard is put to flight, and conquering Caesar, seizing on the bridge, compels the enemy to keep the walls. Now do the mighty engines, soon to hurl gigantic stones, press forward, and the ram creeps neath the ramparts, when the gates fly back, and lo, the traitor troops, foul crime in war, yield up their leader. Him they place before his proud compatriot. Yet, with upright form, and scornful features, and with noble mien, he asks his death. But Caesar knew his wish was punishment, and pardon was his fear. Live, thou thou it's not, so the chieftain spake, and by my gift unwilling, see the day. Be to my conquered foes the cause of hope, proof of my clemency. Nor, if thou wilt, take arms again, 
and shouldst thou conquer, count this pardon nothing. Thus he spake, and bade let loose the bands, and set the captive free. Ah, better had he died, and fortune spared the Roman's last dishonor, whose worst doom it is that he who joined his country's camp and fought with Magnus for the Senate's cause should gain for this a pardon. Yet he curbed his anger, thinking, Wilt thou then to Rome and peaceful scenes, degenerate? Rather war, the furious battle, and the certain end. Break with life's ties. Be Caesar's gift in vain. End of Part 1 of Book 2 of the Pharsalia